In our next lesson on nitrogen metabolism from Chapter 18, we want to look at purine synthesis. Nucleotides can be recycled from nucleic acids or cofactors that are broken down. We can also make what we need de novo, that is from scratch, and as we'll see, we need amino acids to do so. These processes work so well that we have no specific dietary requirements for purines and pyrimidines. In other words, we don't need to include them in our diet because we can either recycle or synthesize what we need. So let's look at purine synthesis. Here are the purine bases adenine and guanine. Remember, these are the more complex dual ring structure, and for this reason, the bases are built on our sugar foundation. And so our first step is to form that sugar, which is 5-phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, or PRPP, and that's illustrated at the bottom of the screen here. We start with ribose 5-phosphate. Remember, we get that from the pentose phosphate pathway. And then we transfer pyrophosphate from ATP to that number one position on our sugar. That's where we're actually going to build our base. So our first step is to make PRPP the sugar on which we'll build these bases. The process requires 10 steps, and we're not going to look at those steps in detail, but it requires certain amino acids, and these you do need to know. It requires glutamine, glycine, aspartate, we also need bicarbonate, and we need four meal groups, and that's carried by that important cofactor, tetrahydrofolate. The product is inosine monophosphate. This, as we'll see, is actually a starting intermediate whereby we'll form both A and P and G and P. The base is hypoxanthine. As you can see, as highlighted in the different colors, we have two nitrogens. These are contributed by two glutamine uh, residues. Glycine contributes a nitrogen and two carbons. Aspartate contributes an amine group. The carbonyl group comes from bicarbonate, and two CH groups come from those four meals donated by tetrahydrofolate. So a very complex structure, again, mostly amino acids used to build our base on top of the sugar. Now that we have our intermediate IMP, we're going to use that to build both purines AMP and GMP. So let's look at that process. On the left, we have the formation of AMP, and it requires the amino acid aspartate. If you compare AMP with our starting material, IMP, you can see we're going to replace that carbonyl with an amine, and that's going to come from aspartate. So on our first step, we add the entire aspartate amino acid, and that requires hydrolysis of GTP. Then we retain that amine group, and fumarate is released, and there we have AMP. On the right, in the formation of GMP, we first add a water and oxidize that to form a carbonyl, and then again we're going to replace the carbonyl with an amine group, and that comes from glutamine and this requires hydrolysis of ATP. The easiest way to keep these apart is that formation of AMP requires the amino acid aspartate and formation of GMP requires the amino acid glutamine. Once we form AMP and GMP, kinases add the phosphoryl groups to convert this to the di and triphosphates. The need for GTP hydrolysis to form AMP and ATP hydrolysis to form GMP gives us a clue as to the regulation of this pathway. In other words, high levels of GTP favor the formation of AMP and high levels of ATP favor the formation of GMP. In other words, high levels of one purine favor the formation of the other purine. This is how the cell ensures a balance of these purine nucleotides, because when we form nucleic acids, we need a fairly even amount of each of the four nucleotides. Remember our first step, the formation of PRPP? It's actually feedback inhibited by the products ADP and GDP. In our next video lesson, we want to look at pyrimidine synthesis and see how that differs from purine synthesis.